everybody. Welcome to today's plant clinic. I'm just going to give us a few seconds here for everyone to take their, some time, get logged on, get your volume adjusted, um, and go ahead and get the live stream started on Facebook. Uh, happy Arbor Day, soon to be. David has a special virtual plant clinic today talking about the selection and planting of trees in honor of that holiday. Um, we got all my boxes popping up here on the screen. Um, so we're, I'm looking forward to hearing about that. And for uh, any of you all who are new, I'm going to keep this quick so that he can jump right in. But if you have questions during this program, uh, you'll type those questions into the Q&A box and we'll be taking questions during the class. So uh, if you have any questions, just send them in through Q&A. Uh, David, I think okay. I made that pretty quick. <laughs> you're, you're good to go. <laughs> All right, well, excellent. Well, thank you for joining me today. I'm, I'm looking forward to doing this um, Arbor Day presentation. It's going to be a little different. I, I'm going to talk quite a bit about this tree ecology, uh, and then I'll come back and sort of connect that a little bit to gardening. So it's not, not my typical sort of gardening thing. Uh, it's going to take a little broader look at trees. Again, I was looking at the calendar and I said, well, tomorrow is Arbor Day. So this just seemed like the appropriate thing to do. Uh, so just a little background on what is Arbor Day. Of course, we always associate Arbor Day with tree planting, uh, which is perfectly, makes perfectly good sense because the very first Arbor Day started in, look at my notes, on April 10 in 1872. And it was Julius Sterling Morton, who was a newspaper writer, but he, he loved trees. He loved everything about trees, and he had recently moved into Nebraska, and the lack of trees out there and the problems they're having, you know, leading up to the dust bowl situation, the soil blowing and eroding and deteriorating, and uh, the environmental degradation that's taking place back in early, like I said, 1872. He recognized the value of trees. He started writing and promoting the planting of trees and first proposed and had the Arbor Day, like I said, in April of 1872. Um, on that day, um, it's thought that they one million trees were planted that day. And then it has taken hold, uh, became adopted as a federal holiday in all 50 states, or I guess state holiday recognized in all 50 states. And it is now um, celebrated on the last Friday of April. So it's got a long history to it. And I think also within that, it has expanded into looking at trees beyond just their value um, or just beyond planting, but just a greater, broader appreciation of trees, which I certainly share. And that's where I wanted to kind of just put that out for everybody today. Another little thing I thought was interesting, and this already I'm getting sidetracked, but I just thought this was fascinating because I'm this guy, Jay Sterling Morton, um, that started and he, um, he did go on to have uh, some political roles and everything in Nebraska, but his name, Jay Sterling Morton. And then I'm also thinking about the Morton Arboretum in the Midwest, which is just a phenomenal resource uh, for the research and preservation and promotion of trees. But it turns out, so Julius Sterling's son, Joy, Joy Martin, then started Morton Salt Company. And Morton Salt, which we all know, uh, he, he built a fortune there, which then his estate was dedicated upon his death and became the Morton Arboretum. So I'm like, these guys were really seriously into trees and what an amazing legacy they have left for us. So that's... um. It's, it's just it's just a great story, and I'm glad to uh, spend some time there with you talking about today. So I wanted to um, start out here talking a little bit about just, like I said, some of the value of trees. And a little bit of the um, understanding on them. So some of these pictures I have used before uh, that you can see, but when you think of a tree, uh, you, there's many, many, many things that might come to your mind, anywhere from sitting in cool shade to beautiful flowers to, you know, timber, uh, anything, that, that all these different things that we associate with trees. But over my uh, years of working with them, studying them, enjoying and appreciating them, what I really have come to see more than anything is just from their, their 
basic, most fundamental function is, you know, trees basically they're capturing the sunlight uh, in their leaves through photosynthesis, creating carbohydrates. So they're taking in the air, the carbon, the oxygen um, through their leaves. They're taking the water up through their leaves and through that uh, miracle of photosynthesis, they're taking what's in the atmosphere around us and converting it into carbohydrates, something as tangible, some as a form of stored energy, stored food that really supports everything else around us. Again, it's, it's plants that, you know, basically created the atmosphere that we breathe, you know, absorbing the carbon, bringing it down to levels um, that allow life to exist. Um, it's plants that are taking these materials, these elements, and converting them into carbohydrates that in turn support us and everything else on the planet as far as the food that we consume. So they're, they're really incredibly important to us um, in so many different ways. I think we need to also recognize that there's so much that goes on below the surface that we don't see. Uh, right now, with the emphasis on looking at trees and their role of sequestering carbon, uh, they're taking, again, carbon out of the atmosphere. They're putting it down in the soil where they can support all the soil biology, all the microbes, all the fungi and the bacteria and the nematodes and everything else that's living in the soil um, is feeding off of exudates, carbohydrates that trees are basically bringing down and putting into the soil. The root mass alone that it puts in uh, is where carbon is stored. Like so 60%, when you look at a tree, you see like 40% of the carbon that we talk about storing is above ground. The other 60% is below ground. So as we go through, you know, more and more and more and more looking at the effects that the, um, you know, increased carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is having on us, the absolute critical value that trees are going to play in um, what they're supposed to do, putting it down in the soil, taking it out of the atmosphere, and the importance and value that they play. So again, it's, it's, it's just, it's, it's time, you know, here at Arbor Day that we really, really give recognition to the role, I'm gonna say plants, but particularly trees. Um, and trees get a lot of this attention in big part because of their longevity um, and their size. So what I'm looking at right here is about 350 year old white oak. Uh, and that's one of the amazing things because they're living on a different time span that we are. And they, they're seeing the whole world in a different way than we see it or experience it. And not all trees serve the same purpose that's in here. The um, white oak is considered a keystone species for many different reasons. Uh, this tree provides so much value to the environment. It's known, and then this is uh, Dr. Talamy's work, looking at how many different caterpillar species, uh, of particularly trees or plants might support. So the white oak is known to be host plant, like over 900 different caterpillars. Um, and those caterpillars are a food source for the birds that feed off of them. The acorns that are produced by this tree, again, that feed so much wildlife, or anything from foxes and squirrels and deer that rely on it. Uh, so it's really a food source for so much that goes on both above ground and below ground. So the species makes a difference. Also, one of the things is the age of the tree makes a difference. Uh, as trees mature and they get bigger, uh, they end up basically creating an environment in and of themselves. They sequester more carbon because of just the size of it. So each year when they put on a new layer of wood, uh, it's a larger mass. And so it's actually sequestering and holding more carbon in there. It also, the character of the tree starts to change. Uh, the bark starts to get rough. It gets furrowed. It starts to hold more moisture. Uh, organic matter starts to accumulate. And then you start getting all these things like you'll see lichens, I mean, or, or hear moss starting to grow on. Uh, lichens, which you can't see on here, but they actually start to adhere themselves and support the tree. And again, lichens are so phenomenal as I learn about those, because we always have this kind of pat answer. Oh, it's a symbiotic relationship between a, an algae and a fungi. And it's like, oh, so now I know. But what we're learning is 
hey, that's actually a whole ecosystem in itself. It's not just one, but there's several different species of fungi and bacteria that live in there. There are mites that live in there. There's nematodes that live in there. And there's predators that feed on those mites. So each one of those becomes a whole little microcosm itself. As they get older, um, the trees become more productive for the wildlife. Um, there's studies that show with birds, if they're given a, a young tree and an old tree, they're making many more, like almost 10 times more visits to the old tree than the young tree, because it's producing more, more um, fruit for it. It's, it's got a more diverse habitat. It's supporting more biodiversity that's in there. You start seeing, it's a little hard to tell, but I think we've got like a little tree cavity up here where the branches are starting uh, to develop some little holes and, and then animals start nesting in there. You can't hardly see them, but this is uh, Michael Gage right back here. He was, um, I had the, the privilege of spending about a week uh, studying with uh, Michael Gage, looking at old trees and learning their ecology of, and just really opening my eyes to a, a different way of looking at them. So they develop this character over time. They support my more biodiversity. And even though Arbor Day is the emphasis on planting trees, I'm trying to really promote the idea of preserving our older trees because folks, you know this, if you live in the DC metro area, you know, most of them are long gone uh, and not coming back and they are irreplaceable. So when I see these old um, keystone species, when they are taken down for agriculture, building roads, um, development, that's it. They're they're gone. They're they're irreplaceable, and I don't really see that coming back. Uh, they also form these these elder trees. Actually, serve to help support and get the younger baby trees up and going, of uh, and nursing them along. So they're so critical um, in all parts of our life. They also have a lot of uh, cultural value. Uh, this is a tulip popper, and if you know a tulip popper, they go straight up out of the ground like a post. Um, big, fast-growing native tree in our area. Uh, this one, with all this very distinctive kind of uh, misshapen branching on there, uh, again, Michael Gage, he, he's the ecologist who was showing me uh, these. He's got a pretty good um, idea on this one, uh, that basically this was in here by the Native Americans. Uh, even before Europeans came, this is a little spring house. Uh, he's got historical records and he plays that against or with in conjunction with the, the history of the trees and their biology. And he's got a pretty com compelling story that he's got a belief that there was a well, a spring located in this area. And Native Americans were known to take trees and either you know split them, divide them lean them one way or another, and they would become signposts uh, to each other and how as they navigate across the countryside. So I thought this is really cool that this is playing into our cultural history where he really believes this was a tree that was a signpost um, configured this way by Native Americans to help find the spring that's um, located where this uh, spring house is there. So yeah, they're, they're just a rich part of our history. Uh, I put this picture in here really because it was just uh, one of these epiphanies for me uh, in my looking at this. So this is an old, old silver maple. And in my, my training as a commercial arborist uh, going back, you know, 30 plus years ago, uh, and I even hate using these words. To me, they're like vulgar words. Almost we, we would call this a trash tree because silver maple it gets silver roots. It grows fast. It's got brittle wood. Um, they're really not suitable for landscape use, but they have great ecological value. And if I had looked at this tree even 20 years ago, 10 years ago, I would look at that and say, oh, this is a declining tree. It's a hazard, it needs to be removed. I would look at this and say, you can see dieback occurring in the crown, it's leaning, it's silver maple, which we know is a brittle wood. And down this bottom here, you'll see there's a, a big cavity, a big pocket of decay. But I was out there, here's our class, we're out there in the rain, you know, with our um, umbrellas and everything. But on this day, this tree really just changed my personal understanding and view of it. And what I see was trained as a declining tree that absolutely needs to be removed. I now see as 
an elder tree that's just renewing itself. It's, it's uh, kind of a, a regrowth, rebirth. If you can look at this at the base, this outer perimeter, at one time, this, this was the perimeter of that tree, right? It went all the way out to here. Of, of course, we don't know this for a fact, but when I look at it and just by interpretation, it's quite likely that there was some fire damage. Uh, you can see this um, even a little bit of a charred look around on this side of it. Quite likely, quite possibly a fire, maybe even a lightning strike or something like that originally um, came in contact with the tree. Whenever a tree is injured, um, whenever the integrity of that bark is compromised, wood decay organisms get in there. That just happens. There's no way to stop it, no way to prevent it. Um, once that wood decay starts, again, the decay, the rot begins to happen. So as this rot progresses, you can see there is another major fork that came out here. So it probably started to re-sprout, became brittle and broke. But you can't really see it because, again, this image was so dark out in that day because it's cloudy and rainy. But you can kind of see right in here all these roots developing. So when I look at it now, I see a, a tree that's got this old history. Um, it had injuries and wounds. It's got decay that's going on there, but it's it's almost like recycling itself. It's cannibalizing itself and where this wood is rotting and it's getting soft and it's holding moisture. It's literally forming roots that are entering into that wood to recycle the nutrients that exist within that. And off to the side, you can see re-sprouting or rebirthing. So again, it's just um, a different perspective of looking at um, how plants are going to behave over time. We also see that trees, even in their death, um, provide so much life. This was um, out at Meadow Art Gardens, and they've intentionally left this old tree standing, even though it's dead. Um, you can see how it is all riddled with holes and pockmarks. So as that wood's rotting and decaying, you're getting everything from carbon durants and centipedes and termites, and then you're getting, you know, woodpeckers and birds, even bats like to get in here and nest under this bark. So it becomes a, such a source of rich biodiversity and habitat that if and where it's appropriate, if we can leave them, they're still providing a tremendous amount of ecological value. So here they wisely cut the top of it out so that it wouldn't pose a hazard. It wouldn't accidentally drop and fall and damage the old ruins or hurt somebody, but they left it there to provide that kind of habitat that's behind. So there are some researchers that um, are out there trying to call it like what they would call the non-economic value of trees, where too often I think they were looked at as just production. It was a raw material for wood products, which, which we absolutely rely on but really trying to bring forward um, what they do so much for our planet and for our life around us. But I just, I've always wanted to talk to everybody about that and try to get a little different perspective going, but I'm also gonna try to bring this back a little bit of a practicality and how this fits into landscaping. Um, because when we're talking about gardening or landscaping, I realize much of this is idealistic. Uh, we live on properties that are too small to support these large species. Uh, with urbanization development, things move too fast, you know, for some of these that, that may be living for centuries. Um, and now is what I'm going to say, uh, my view of trees as a, as a retail person uh, is how I look at it. So if you're inspired to plant trees at Arbor Day, if um, we're around, what I usually like to begin is I really talk with you, the customer, the clients. And really I'm trying to not so much think about the trees, but now we switch that and put the customer sort of at the center of that uh, conversation. So what I would say in terms of selecting, I'm gonna begin, you know, somebody say, I wanna buy a tree and my, I'm usually answer that question. Well, what, what are you looking for? Is this something that you're looking for? Just like a, a small flowering accent that's in there? Is this something that's gonna create shade over the house? Um, are you planting it for, to create privacy or a sense of enclosure? I feel like when we're putting plants in our landscape, it has basically a job to do. Maybe you are putting it there just for the ecological value of providing um, food and shelter for the wildlife. You know, that's fantastic. Uh, the other part that I will look at once we sort of discuss the 
the goal of that tree is what's going to be its size as maturity and what really is maturity. Because most of the problems, I'll say, most of the complaints or issues or things that go wrong with our tree planting is really just a lack of planting, a lack of planning and not having the foresight when it comes to making our choices and selections. So I use this as an example, uh, Nellie Stevens Holly. In many ways, this is my probably one of my, my favorite holly for a lot of reasons. Uh, it's a hybrid between the English and Chinese. So they're very vigorous, they're very robust, they're very dense, they're fast growing. They're um, rock solid, gorgeous, beautiful holly. Uh, the thing is, we really, the last thing we need to be doing is planting them in this kind of a monoculture kind of a row. Uh, because any plant gets pests. If this plant gets, uh, for example, cottony camellia scale, you know, then it's got food galore on this one place. They can be somewhat subject to winter damage. So under really dry, cold, windy conditions, you could see it. Uh, this is one of the few hollies that deer might browse on. So uh, that could be a concern. So I would never want to plant them as far as the eye can see. I think we really have to mix that up into a more diverse mixture again, and we just keep supporting the biodiversities there. But the reason I'm putting this in here is this is an Ellie Stevens holly that's about 30 feet, or about 30 years old. I intentionally, so this light post is in here. So this is probably a good 15 feet to the top of this light post. Um, and you can see we still have another 10 feet to go on here. So Nellie Stevens, I see a lot of times people, uh, plant them at the corner of their house or beside their doors and entrance feature. Uh, that is going to be a problem. Uh, that's just a lack of foresight, a lack of vision looking ahead that's on there. Even that row of Nellie Stevens I was showing earlier, they might have been planted, what, six feet apart? Um, but look, this plant has probably got to be at least 12 feet wide. Um, and we prune this about once every three years or so. So again, this is what I'm saying. Um, let's try to take a little bit longer view on that. Um, this is some type of an oak, uh, which we talked about the value of oaks and how wonderful they are. But this is in uh, downtown Culpeper, and I'm trying to look at this really bizarre looking root plate uh, that's going on. And what has happened in this case is they were planted as street trees. I'm going to guess, I don't really know the history on these, but just based on the size, the conditions, they're probably 40, 50 years old, something in that range. The sidewalk, when they were installing this, the sidewalk had maybe this little three foot by three foot cutout. And so again, this is that just that lack of planting. They were squeezed into there. There's no space for these roots to grow. And then later, at some point in time, they were doing a downtown revitalization. And at that point, they broke out the sidewalk, expanded, and were able to get more room in there. Uh, so that's wonderful. But at the same time, I look at that and say, it's not. A real stable kind of root system, you know, trees like this, given the size, the way those roots are developing, the constricted root zone, you know, there's there's a pretty good potential for these to to fail at one point in time, and that kind of also brings up a thought that you know, trees don't just die from old age or something. That's not predetermined. Something kills the tree. Um, oftentimes, it's literally just the size where they're growing and they're growing. They get to a point where they can't support the, their weight. And so literally just the, the weight and structure of a tree. And when it's got an unstable root system like this, it will reach a point in time where it just topples over. Uh, so again, hey, this might have worked. Um, again, I'm guessing these might have worked for the first you know, 40 or 50 years, but there's no way they're going to be there in the next 50 years. So this brings up. A lot of times when I'm talking with customers now, especially in landscape plantings, I frequently talk to you about what's its useful life. So we can talk about trees in terms of earlier we're looking at, at trees that live to be 300, 400 years old. But in our modern landscapes, very, very, very little chance of that actually happening. So they'll live as long as they're serving that purpose. Um, and it, then at some point in time, um, the environment changes, you know, the bulldoze pushed over, topple over, something like that, cutting it short. So what all that means to you in terms of selecting a tree, it's like, well, 
I have so many customers say, well, we're only going to be here for in the house for three years. Or I'm going to be here for five years. I'm going to be here for 10 years. Uh, I really always, always try to push people to take a little bit longer view. Can we at least look like maybe 15, 20 years out? Because if you're planting on a five-year plan, it's going to be overgrown and pretty much its usefulness is over in 10 years. If I can get you on a 10-year plan, it'll be like overgrown and, and outlive its usefulness maybe 15 years. But those are all the things that we talk about when we negotiate and contemplate and figure out. Uh, there's also things like the aesthetics, like I said, the flower color, the seasonal interest, you know, maintenance that goes into it. But what I'm doing in all that conversations, at that point, I'm putting the, the customer or me, if I'm choosing one, I'm putting the person at the center of the conversation. And then after we've determined all the goals, the needs, the objectives, the size constraints, the time frames, we go through all that conversation, figure out puts us in an area of what might be available to us. Then I put trees at the back of the conversation. This is so backwards from, from my background, but I found that it seems to really work best for us. At that point, I start looking at how much sun, how much shade, what's the drainage, all those kind of things, and try to find a tree that would match um, your needs, goals, and objectives. So to that end, you've kind of come down, you figured out what you want, you come out to the nursery and we have thousands of trees to choose from at this time of year. This picture was taken, I don't know, two, three weeks ago, um, and we've continued to get more trees in since this time. Uh, one of the things that I like to talk to you about is what size of tree are you going to purchase? There's an idea that everybody says, hey, I don't have the time. I need it now. You know, I'm not getting any younger or immediate gratification. And they will look for a larger specimen tree. So this is about a, a three and a half inch caliper bur oak. Beautiful, gorgeous, spectacular specimen of a tree that's there. Um, these are, I think, probably about five gallon pot uh, dogwoods that's in there. One of the things that we know is when you dig these trees out of the ground or you grow them in a pot like that, um, you don't have that big expanse of root system. You think back to the second picture where those roots were going way out like this. These, I've got a root system that's kind of like this. And what it's going to do is it takes time to get those roots reestablished. Usually I turned the phone off, forgot today. Uh, so it's going to take time to reestablish. And our rule of thumb is if you have a one inch cowper tree, it takes one year, two inch cowper tree, two years, three inch cowper, three years, four inch cowper, four years, so big tree like this, it's going to take it about four years to get its roots reestablished and resuming its normal growth rate. So a lot of times I like to use smaller trees because if I put a one inch tree and a four inch tree on the same day, first year they sit there, second year this guy's growing, third year this guy's growing, fourth year this one's growing, fifth year this one starts growing, but the little one has now outpaced the large one that's in there. So these large specimens, if you, if you need that immediate instant gratification, they absolutely do that, but you get a smaller one and sometimes we have a higher survival rate and they establish much quicker that's in there. And during this establishment time, watering is also critical responsibility that you have on there because their, their root systems are compromised and they haven't been fully replaced. Uh, this is this big bur oak that I'm showing you. We are growers. I mean, our, our, our buying team, our shopping team, one of the things that we do that other nurseries don't is we actually send our purchasing team out to the growers. We hand select. Uh, this is our tag. We put on these large specimens. We put our tag on there. You know, it's, it's cannot be removed and said, that's our tree. We're not you know, we're not working through middlemen. Some, we're not letting um, other people pick them out for us. We are picking them out for our nursery, for our garden center, for our customers. So we go through a lot of effort to get plants like this that have this beautiful, gorgeous structure and look their really best. Um, and we, and that's something that we can do. That we bring to you as a part of the service when you're shopping here. So we're selecting good trees that, that meet our goals and purposes and good health. Um, and then it's also on the installation of it. 
some of the things that we emphasize is what we're seeing here is on a field grown tree, a bald and burlap tree. Uh, we're getting instruction. This is where that root collar is. That's where the root flare is. Um, that root collar, or root flare, that stem tissue, it should be visible. It should be up, up, up. It should be level with the ground. It should be visible. It's in there, not buried. This is a container grown tree of where we're learning about the importance of pulling off what could be girdling roots, um, circling roots that's in there, getting that root ball prepared for installation. So the installation um, to get them off to the best healthy start is important. And then probably the single most important thing is the watering. Again, keep in mind what I'm saying, an established tree has roots that where 60% of the tree is below ground. A new tree has roots that's in here. So when we're watering, that water must be directed onto the root ball. If you have a day of rain, that's almost insignificant because this tree doesn't have roots out there. It's not getting the rain. It's only get what lands in that little um, root zone that's there. So I really, really feel strongly about hand watering directly on that root ball. Um, this is a gator bag. Uh, which holds about 20 gallons of water. You fill it up and it's got little holes that allow to slowly percolate out directly onto that root ball. So there's different ways of doing this, but I want you watering right on that root ball. And the other thing is, uh, I was just checking, this is um, January through March of 2023 is the driest year that we've had here in Virginia since, um, I think it was like 1895 or something like that. I, I wrote it down and then forgot. Um, but we are in ridiculously dry conditions. So it's everybody, even though we had a brief rain, you know, maybe uh, was that a week ago or something, everything is very dry that's out there. Uh, so please just go out there, check your garden, check the soil. I think pretty much everything needs to be watered. And when I say check, there's different ways of doing this. Um, we tried all these different kinds of meters and probes. Uh, only somewhat useful. A lot of them, a lot of these smaller ones are really calibrated um, and designed for use on potted plants. They're not really sturdy enough for use out in the landscape. Uh, they're not, again, calibrated for that moisture. So some people like them and use them because it's a, it's a tool. Um, it gives you information, but you're still going to be need to use your judgment in deciding when it's time to water. The one that I really like, and this is not practical for too many people, but this is a soil auger. I carry one with me because I do this professionally. It allows me to pull a plug out of that soil and really feel the soil, know what's going on in there. So when we water the plants, again, we want to water on that root ball and we want to make sure it soaks in there. Now we want to saturate it completely till it's really just soaking wet. Then we're going to leave it alone. We're going to come back and check the soil moisture. And you can do this little hand trowel and put your fingers in the soil. Um, you can, you know, these these augers are great, but you know, it's, they're not they're not cheap, and that's one of the things you have to kind of justify. So most of us just a little hand trowel, put your fingers in there. It should feel like a wet sponge. If you feel drier than that, then it's time to water. By the same token, you can overwater plants because those roots, back to our original diagram, they need oxygen. So if that ground is totally saturated, then they're going to literally drown under there. So I've given you like the just a super quick version on that. We have these guides um, and we, we want you to be successful. These guides will go through in detail specifically this one on the planting instructions and also as planting and watering. Uh, we have this one that just focuses on watering. But again, these are just some of the resources that we have here to help you. So I'm wrapping this thing up so we can get to our questions. And I've been talking too much here. Uh, but again, just keep an open mind, you know, look at trees a little bit differently. I uh, put this as our native um, juniper, the red cedar, Junipers virginiana out at uh, Manassas National Battlefield, sitting up there on Henry's Hill. Just thought this was just a, a glorious, glorious um Older tree, not, not ancient. I think this is what we'd call a veteran tree. It's been out there, it's facing a harsh conditions. Full sun, full cold, wind, no shelter, no protection at all. Um, tourists, you know, climbing on it, kids climbing on it, walking on it. Um, 
And through all those kind of harsh conditions, it just hangs on there, keeps out there, growing a little time, growing a little time, surviving. So it's it's aged prematurely because all the stresses are under. So it looks ancient, but I don't think it really is that old. But it's just a gorgeous, gorgeous tree. Uh, a lot of times people look at that and say, hey, it was misshapen. But I look at it now and I just see, wow, this is this is a tough character. It's out there taking everything, just standing there, standing all the tests of time and stress we put on. So again, just a real quick summary on this. Uh, when you are thinking Arbor Day, if you're going to be out there planting trees, think ahead, um, set whatever your realistic time frame is. Are you planting for the next 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years? Um, kind of be realistic and select trees and place them with all that in mind. Um, critical that we maintain a diversity of plants that's out there, that we maintain a biodiversity. Um, and again, that's why I love so important that we can preserve any of our older existing trees because it takes time to develop. And when we lose these, um, they're irreplaceable. Uh, we always, always want to put um, native plants at the front of the row uh, where we can, because again, the native plants are what's going to be best adapted to supporting the native um, flora and, and fauna and the insects and animals and stuff that live on them and depend on them, uh, keeping a, a more intact food chain. And then again, I just say, can't say enough, enough. You know, we just got to diversify, diversify, diversify. And with that, I am going to stop and see if you have any thoughts to share or just as we celebrate trees or any questions we might have. All right. Yes, we do have questions. First of all, we got a very nice comment from Jenny. She says, your love and passion for trees radiates through the screen. That was very nice. Thought I'd share that. Thank you, Jenny. Um, okay. First question. Oh, I know you've talked about this um, to me in the past. Are there any signs that volcano mulching over the years has killed the tree? Yeah, it's, it's a horrible thing, too, because basically that's what I'm saying, that root flare, that root collar, if you, if you go out and you look at a forest, you know, an acorn, squirrel plants an acorn, and it grows, that tree has this root flare, it comes straight down the sides, and then gets a little broader at the base. That is stem tissue. That should be above ground. When we volcano mulch, when we pile mulch up against the stem of the plant, it traps moisture on there. There's no... Um, it, it can't, there's no gas exchange between the plant and the environment. Holding that moisture up there is horrible because as I talked about, um, the bark, that bark is there to protect the tree. Right behind the bark is the vascular tissue where all the water nutrients are conveyed and that bark protects all that. If you've got mulch piled up there and it maintains moisture and it can't air, no air circulation doesn't breathe, Slowly, the integrity of that bark starts to rot and decay. And then once that bark is compromised, all kinds of pathogens and insects and everything else get in there. So the volcano mulching will kill trees, no question about it. But it's a slow process. It's a progressive one that occurs over years of time. So when you become aware of it, it's past the point you can do anything about. So again, it's just a, a real educational effort um, it, that we've been beating the drum about for decades, but it still persists for reasons I cannot explain. Okay. Um, next question. We've had a couple questions about crepe myrtles. How do you prevent black sooty mold on crepe myrtle trees? I, I kind of expected that question almost to come up because it's I was wondering if there's been an issue with it everything. Lately. Yeah. Uh, so sooty mold, first of all, so they're, they're piercing sucking insects. Um, on crepe myrtles, uh, there's a crepe myrtle aphid uh, that gets up in the leaves in the canopy. And as they're sucking juice out of the crepe myrtle, they secrete this sticky sugary uh, substrate. And then the sooty mold is not really a plant pathogen. The sooty mold is a secondary problem because it's growing on the exudate that's coming from the insects. Uh, more recently, really last summer, hit us big time, this called crepe myrtle bark scale. It's also a piercing sucking insect, but you can see them along the branches and the stem. And they're sitting there, they're sucking juice out of the plant, same kind of habit. And then as they're feeding, um, they secrete that residue and the sooty mold comes in. So again, the sooty mold's not a pathogen, but it's an indicator of an insect problem 
and then we need to identify and treat the insect. Uh, and there's, there's, again, the best way is either come into the plant clinic, talk with us. We got people that know this and we can help you with um, identifying that, making recommendations. You're welcome to send photos to me, but I'd like to begin by getting the problem identified and then we go through treatment option. But real quick, I gotta say, cause I've been, I've been trying to, been on this uh, soapbox for years also. Uh, great myrtle is a beautiful plant. Gorgeous flowers, um, tough, durable, grows heat and drought tolerant, interesting bark, fall color. Uh, again, like I said, an emphasis on the flowers, every color, shape, size of out there. So, so there's we have a love affair with crepe myrtles for good reason. But when we take them and we plant them in every residential landscape, every shopping mall, every parking lot, every office building, every hotel, um, when we become so dependent on that plant, it's just going to happen that you get an introduced pest like the crepe myrtle bark scale. We provided them with, you know, unlimited food source, and then the population that just explodes, which is kind of where we are right now. So I'm using that to really just emphasize my diversity uh, message. Mix it up, even though we, you've, you've got a lot of beautiful plants to choose from, it doesn't have to be all the same thing. Okay. All right. Sorry, I'm typing a couple of questions. Um, we had someone ask, so I want to just make sure everybody knows this. Um, if they could have an arborist from the team come out and look at some of their trees on their property. And the answer to that is yes, you just need to contact our stores to book an appointment. Um, so you can, you can call us and we'll help you with that. Um, plus David's always available at the plant clinic for- I'm gonna jump in and say, I'm gonna, I'm, I wanna say it's kind of a qualified yes. Yes. Um, a qualified yes, in that we really have one certified arborist on our staff and so, um, we're not going to be doing like risk hazards or, or assessments or some of the specialized work that's involved. You know, you might reach out more towards a full service company, but yeah, we, we certainly like we can transplant large trees, um, you know, tree work in conjunction landscaping and stuff. We can, we can help you, but I'm putting little qualifications in that because otherwise our, our one- Thank you. I always forget about some of the more specialized stuff. I only yeah. think of our type yeah. of stuff. Yeah, he <laughs> well, was, I, I was talking pretty... to him yesterday. He gets a little overwhelmed sometimes. So oh, I'm, I'm sure, yeah. That's no reason I'm putting a couple of boundaries on that. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, next question. I'm going to skip a few because I think this is a general one that's important. They're all, they're all important. It's just this one applies to the most people. Um, can landscaping trees that have been left too long in a garden area be dug up and planted in the ground? Um, so this Jenny has a dwarf Alberta spruce here that, that was there when they bought their house 10 to 15 years ago. So can, can she move that tree? Um, what... Yeah, so it, usually it is possible. Okay. It may not be practical. What, what I found, again, is this every, every situation is unique, and this is, this is the kind of service we can help you with. Uh, it becomes a, a situation where oftentimes it's going to be more expensive to take an existing tree and transplant and relocate it. And when you do that, it's more disruptive you have less um, six, lower success rate and no guarantees. If you were to buy a new tree, uh, oftentimes it's less expensive and you have a warranty. So this is the thing that I've, I've had to learn over the years is sometimes it's a matter of practicality. So while conceptually, yes, they can be moved, oftentimes, most of the time, it comes down to where the, the dollars just don't add up. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Um, let's see here. If you have suggestions for an understory screening evergreen that would take shade under a crepe myrtle, we just, I think I just got this question by email and we had this last week on Michael, Michael's class. Um, understory screening evergreen that under 14 or so. Do you have um, any ideas? So, so my favorite, and, I, and again, I don't know ultimately the size and the details. Yeah look at but one of my favorite most reliable for that is what's called a Japanese plum you oh Joel and Michael talked about that the other week um yeah. in their class yeah and we, there's about three different varieties you know different sizes and everything but in terms of shade tolerance reliability 
um, and variety, that that's a really hard one to beat. Okay, okay. Um, if part of the bark is off the tree, say eight square inches, what should I do? It might be due to deer antlers or some other reason. Does so, so, yeah, bark coming off the tree is never a good sign. Um, now, sometimes there's trees like crepe myrtle and birch that have exfoliating or peeling bark. But usually what that is telling me that the, um, the inner bark where the living part of the tree is has died. And now that older bark is separating off. The sad thing about this is there is no treatment for this. Um, you'll see wound dressings and paints and bandages, but all that has been pretty, totally discounted um, by science. I think what happened was when, when, when we cut ourselves, let's say I get an injury, I clean it, I put an ointment on there, and I wrap it in a bandage. And we didn't know what to do with trees, so we repeated that same process on trees. All it does is make you feel good, like you're doing something to, to help the tree. Um, but in reality, wood decay is in there. It, wood decay is uh, progressing. And wood decay is not a death sentence. Trees trees are adapted to this, and they start forming new wood. Like I said, each year they put a new layer of wood on, and they gradually start to compartmentalize or seal that in there. So it depends on the size, the location, the species, all that kind of thing. Again, you can always send me pictures. Um, and, and you can sort of try to come up with a plan, get an idea what's what you can do, but but all we can really do is try to prevent injury from occurring. Uh, again, I worked as an arborist on construction sites, and that's one of the things that we tried so hard to do is prevent the damage. Because once it is damaged, that's a done deal. The tree's gonna live with it the rest of its life, however long that is. Okay. Um, oh man, we have so many questions coming in and we're already past time. Um, okay, I had one I wanted to make sure that we got to, um, and then I know we need to we need to, to finish up, but um, here's a question about planting. Lynn says, I always plant trees in October. The summers can get so hot and I'm afraid they, they will be in shock. Are you saying it's any okay to plant any time? Uh, in my opinion, the answer is yes. And this year could not have been a better example. I feel that when you're planting a new tree, you are making a commitment to watering, whatever time of year you do that. So this year, if you planted in October, and many people did, uh, you planted in October from November through December, uh, we went down into single digit temperatures. We didn't get any snow this year. Uh, we didn't get any rain this spring, and I've had more replacements um, of dead trees in the past month than, than, than I can almost ever imagine in the past 26 years. Um, and it's because everybody, nobody, is thinking about watering in the winter, um, and particularly evergreens that are continuing to transpire. So many plants have died out, newly installed plants. So my point is, if you plant in April, June, or October, um, you are responsible for the watering. Uh, it's just that simple because mm -hmm. July was always a dry month. Now July is a wet month. Um, we have dry in the winter. I, it's, you can no longer predict the weather, and I don't really follow the seasons anymore. Okay. All right. Oh man, okay, I'm sorry everybody. We've got way more questions than we're gonna be able to get to today. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and have to call it off. Um, <laughs> but I please, please, please feel free to send me an email. Um, you can reach David as well if you give him a call um, and I'll forward any emails you guys send to me onto him uh, so that he can answer your questions. There's all, David, there's all kinds of questions coming in about trees. Um, I'm so glad to hear that. Let's, let's, we keep <laughs> yeah. this short because I got a short attention span. You do, and it's like <laughs> always builds some momentum for more. Yeah, we are you know, every the week. Um, oh, okay, a few quick announcements for you guys that are going to be important for you over the next few weeks. Um, we do slow down our classes in May just because the store gets so busy. Uh, the plant clinic is going to be taking a break through mid to late June. We'll be back um, at some point late June or early July. Uh, is the plan as of now. Uh, and we're going to be having some Zoom classes in May and then resuming our in-person classes 
uh, definitely in mid to late June for pollinator week, which is June, okay, June 18th to 24th. Um, and then we'll be having some in-person stuff. So just keep an eye on our website and in our email for the, the upcoming schedule, because we will be continuing. We're just going to be taking a little bit, a little bit of a break. Um, I think Peg has some Zoom classes she's going to be doing in May, but but, but just not as much, not as much because everybody's in the store and out in their gardens. Um, David, that's it for me. Do you have anything else you want to wrap up with? I just want to say happy Arbor Day and it's tomorrow. Um, so whether you're planting trees, preserving trees, or just out enjoying them, um, just give them a salute, give them a high five. Um, and again, like I said, even if I don't see you here on Zoom, I work at the Fair Oaks store Monday through Friday. I'm at the Maryfield store on Saturdays and love to see you in person. All righty. Well, thank you so much, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. And we look forward to seeing you again for our next event. Have a good day. Bye, David. Bye-bye.